Hi everyone, thanks for watching an online panel about online panels. Like everyone else, we're trying new things to try and work out the best way to take our real world events into the virtual realm while we're all isolated due to COVID-19. This was one of our first goes at it and we learned a lot. Just for context, before we recorded the panel discussion, we hosted a Zoom meeting for the networking component of the event. Attendees were randomly assigned to breakout rooms within Zoom where they were able to turn on their microphones and cameras and make some new connections. We did this in order to try and replicate the networking component that a normal live networks event has. Um, and we talk about it during the panel discussion. So I thought I should give you some context. One of the things we were trying to show was the visual difference between being on screen from your office or home like I am now, or being on screen from a studio with some higher production values. So apologies for recording this first bit from my office, which as you'll soon see, was replaced on the night by Select AV's beautiful studio space. Anyway, enjoy. Hello, welcome to the panel room where we're going to have a fantastic conversation very soon about how to host online panels in an online panel. Now, um, for those who haven't met me yet, my name is Kat Matz and I am Brisbane's Chief Digital Officer and have been so for about the last four years. Uh, for those who haven't seen me MC or facilitate a networks panel, this is something that I did for about five years. I had to step down about five years ago when the other um, role was too, um, got too demanding and it is my extraordinary pleasure to be your facilitator for this evening. So... For those who haven't been to a Networks event before, let me just give you an overview of what Networks looks like, well, in the offline world as well as in the online world. It's an opportunity to meet, to network, to mingle, to connect with new people and to learn some new things. And one of the things that I've always loved about Networks is that it is a panel conversation. And so you learn just as much from the individual speakers as you do from perhaps the arguments, the disagreements or the spaces in between the panelists. So as I try to multitask and figure out how to do what I need to do right now to bring on our panelists, Hello, we have one panelist. So we have Jody Parker. Jody is the managing. Oh, that was that was one of those weird moments where we were like, "Oh my giddy aunt, what are we actually doing here?" But I can see that it's actually working. And yes, Ingrid, Ingrid saying, "I'll be reminded of this experience when I get frustrated with students who can, yeah who can't connect." We're the experts. We know what we're doing. So please welcome Jody Parker, the managing director of Iceberg Events, and therefore, of course, Networks Brisbane. Welcome, Jody. Clap, 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 clap. Then I'm going to bring on board, hmm, I'd like to bring on board Tanya. <laughs> and now all we need is Ash, and then we've got all three of our panellists, and I'll introduce them all. Oh, there's Ash. Hello. Hey. like magic. So to introduce the other people that you can now see on your screen, we have Ashley Moon. Ashley is the technical director at Select Audiovisual, not the tech director at Zoom. Let's be really clear. The tech director at Select Audiovisual. Please welcome Ashley. And of course, we have Tanya Tipman. Uh, Tanya is the head of strategic innovation at BDO in Australia. Welcome, Tanya. All righty. So I'm going to flick on one of my multiple screens. I have too many screens tonight. And let's get stuck into this conversation. All about how do we actually, first of all, get our participants, our online audience, doing what we need them to do in these kind of scenarios. Because you can't use the mum voice and you can't, you know, use all of those hand gestures to kind of huddle people into a room. So... Jody, would you like to kick us off? How do we how do we get our audience to do what we want them to do in an online panel scenario? Well, I think you did a great job at the beginning, telling everyone to turn their mics off and turn their um, videos off at the beginning. And we did send that out in the um, in the information going out in the first place, because you know I think we've all seen those pictures online of people's Zoom meetings. Like, have we got my slide, Ash? Of um, people's children in the background or people's naked husbands walking behind them. You've seen naked husbands? 
Oh yeah. I haven't personally seen a naked husband, but I have heard stories and stories about going to the loo and that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. that's very much. I, and I was, I had a, a meeting um, on zoom just this week and, and, you know, with everyone in that virtual environment, I had had that exact situation where, you know, sometimes I think when you don't see the video on screen, so you don't realize what's projecting and someone and I, and the lady that I was um, having the meeting with the, uh, the husband had just come out of the pool in his little swimmers and, you know, had walked behind and, uh, you know, it was just quite funny. And I'm trying to sort of give, give some tips and tricks about how you can maybe mask your background um, because it's, uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's one of those things that we're seeing a lot of that happen at the moment because of the, the environment that um, everyone's been forced into very rapidly. So everyone's adapting, you know, quite quickly at the moment. And it's funny, isn't it? I think in a, in a meeting environment when you're hanging, when you're catching up with your team or even with a client, it's, it's kind of acceptable to have the kids pop up and give you, give you a cuddle or something. But on an event like this where you're actually you're hosting an online panel, you're doing your best to mimic um, an, an offline experience, you kind of don't want the kids or the, you know, you want to minimise all of those interruptions as much as possible, don't you, when you really want to have that uh, delightful experience. Um, what else do, I was just thinking, what are some of the other things that we want our audience to do? How do we get them to engage? How do, how do we get them to not just be kind of sitting here flicking through multiple tabs instead of watching us? Because it's all about us right now. <laughs> I really like those breakout rooms. We tried them in the networks event we had on Tuesday night and everyone really enjoyed them. We tried doing it just by the chat bot first and it didn't work. Like, well, it did work, but not quite as well. Um, so I think the breakout rooms force people to talk to other people that maybe they would be too scared to talk to at a real life situation. Yeah, nice. Nice. And it's funny, I participated in some of those breakout rooms yesterday um, and found them nowhere near as awkward as I was expecting them to be. Yeah. It's interesting, it was, isn't it? It is. It is very interesting. I think a lot of people certainly feel as though they can speak up um, a lot easier in that um, environment as well. So because it's nice and, and cosy and it's a small room, um, you will get a lot more interaction than in, you know, in a large room. And, and uh, actually, even in one of in our breakout room um, just earlier, there's, a, you know, we had a, a comment that um, someone who would not normally go to networking events, but was far more comfortable speaking in a breakout room in that environment. So, um, so, you know, I think that uh, we're going to very quickly adapt and, and there's a lot of benefits um, to having, you know, this virtual world. So we've really got to look to, you know, the positives and, and the way in which this is shaping and going to change the future of what, how we do things. Absolutely. Now I've just had a question pop up in the Q and A panel that I'll put to the panel now, cause it is timely. Um, does webinar have breakout rooms? I thought they didn't. And that's very true. That's actually why we've just used two different platforms. So Jody, can you talk about the difference between the two platforms that we've just used? Oh, I don't know how technical I can be. That was not very nice. Um, but that was the reason that we did the switch is because this webinar platform, which um, Ash, correct me if I'm wrong, you can broadcast to like 10,000 people. Correct. Um, yeah. It doesn't have the breakout room facility that the smaller Zoom meetings do. So we really wanted to maintain the networking part of it. Um, but then we also wanted to showcase the cool webinar stuff that, um, that Ash can do. So we did that very difficult weird transition <laughs> that I hope worked. <laughs> yeah, I, let's just say I think I've sweated more in the last 10 minutes than I would normally sweat in a, <laughs> in a real life event. Um, and that's funny because I'm sitting here almost in my, in my hippie pants. So I, I think that's quite funny. Ash, let's bring you on the co in on the conversation because I have a fear that Jodie, Tanya and I could just wrap it on for hours. Um, what, if you're at the organiser of an online panel, what are some of the things that you need to think of above and beyond your normal organising of a face-to-face -face panel event? Absolutely. Look, um, just think of it as you would as a normal event, just virtually. So whatever you would do in a normal event, you would do that just virtually. So think about your presenters, uh, their, where they are, what they're going to be looking like. Um, think of it as though they're on stage as well. So, for example, whatever you would do on stage, you would do the same in front of your computer. As simple as that. You know, like you're not going to eat a bowl of cereal while you're on stage. So 
just because you happen to be at home, <laughs> there's no reason why you should be doing that as well in terms of from the panelist's point of view and any presenter for that matter. Part of, uh, sorry, yeah, on, part of what we were also trying to showcase was the lovely background and lighting and things that um, could be done um, if you wanted to make your panel look a bit schmicker as opposed to... Um, Absolutely. It's all, it's all about... Comp uh, yeah, it's all about composition, how you compose the, um, like the viewing where your camera is positioned in terms of where you are. Um, so you see where Jodie is, she's got a nice background. Whereas you, Kat, you're just in your office at home, yep. so you have to you have to have be very cautious of what is behind you, and not just what is behind you, but what is in front of you as well. In terms of lighting, you yep. always have to make sure you have front light, or otherwise you'll just look very dark and dim. Yeah, absolutely. And are you feeling sure very self conscious now? <laughs> I'm no. feeling very self conscious <laughs> after that. I'm That's very lucky. That. I'm very lucky <laughs> that I got to be professionally lit for this event. <laughs> Yeah, it's the same as it would be in a normal event live. I mean, live, you have a stage, you have lights in front of you. It's no th different to when you're doing a, a um, on film like we are now. I think it is interesting, though, because um, as you're saying, just do what you would normally do. One of the things that was a conscious decision in tonight's pod, uh, web, webinar and networking event was the music. The waiting, basically the music that you heard when you entered each of the rooms because we've all now been in online events where that doesn't exist. And so it's kind of like, oh, are we here? And in mm. fact, because we were having the technical challenges that we were were, we ended up getting some comments going, uh, panel, are you here? Or have we just all come into an odd room? So yeah. remembering that you don't have the, the physical cues of everyone being in a room, you've actually got to overcompensate for some of those things. And someone's just asked, how do you front light if you're at home when you don't have a stage and professional like lighting like we do here at the moment? Um, there's a few different options you can do. If It's a lot easier if you're during the day. Sit yourself in front of a big window if it's a nice sunny day. Uh, the other option too is use some lamps, desk lamps, office lamps, anything like that. When I was at, I was at home the other day actually on a Zoom meeting and I was quite dark and I just took a um, shade off of one of my lamps and popped that in there for a bit of makeshift front light. Very nice, very nice. What about the registration logistics, Jody? Um, how are they different or the same to a normal event? Um, well, I think I think we're all struggling with um, with access to this kind of thing because the while you can password protect Zoom meetings and that kind of thing, you you still have to email it out to people or send it out to people somehow, and then they can share it. And um, I, so personally, I'm I'm still struggling with that. We ran the registration for this and for networks the same way we always did. And then we sent out the link um, to the event. But I think what we discovered with the networks one is that sending out the reminder 24 hours before, like we do for a live event, is not the thing to do for an, on, for an online one. If you send, you need to send it out like three hours before for an online event. Otherwise, people forget it's on, I think. All right. So the, the lack of physical attendance um, yeah, because doesn't, if you are, doesn't clock. Like, no, because I, I would tend to think, what am I doing tomorrow? And I get this email today that tells me what I'm doing tomorrow. But when it's just online and you're just looking at your computer screen, I think you can just forget because yeah. you've got nowhere to go. Beautiful. Um, Gil's asking another question that I think is actually um, in line with what we're talking about here. Um, how do you get your guests to get their tech working first? Um, does Zoom have any facilities in the webinar for the event tech producer to get the talent ready and tested? Um, my, yeah. my, well, my answer, ha having sat, what we've just sat through, is that yes, but not in the same room. So as in we had to, we, 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 we all had a practice run yesterday, we all jumped in um, this evening again as well, but then some of us jumped out, used different, um, used different browsers and whatnot, and so the testing had to, well, the testing went out the window, didn't it, Ash? Yeah, it did a little bit. And I think because we're all in separate locations, it's a lot harder. You can't just call Ash and go, Ash, come over to my computer and fix this for me, <laughs> like you would live. Yeah. There's a couple of different ways you can do that as well. I mean, we're just talking about Zoom at the moment because that just happens to be what we're currently using. Um, there's so many different platforms out there as well where it depends on the level of management you want as well. So we can actually run complete virtual speakers prep rooms which alleviates that problem as well. So if we're doing a live conference, for example, virtually, uh, we'll have the presenters coming into a speaker's prep room. We then speak to them 
make sure that all their lighting's right, their camera angles are okay, their audio level's okay, and also bandwidth and their internet connection. That's also a big one as well. People don't yeah. realize sometimes they just think a normal Wi-Fi um, hotel guest Wi-Fi will work <laughs> adequately. <laughs> Not really. No. As well so, as that, we've got um, giving away secrets. We have a back channel going on here with a, mm. a WhatsApp group where we can all talk to each other and not broadcast it to all the attendees. I think that's really important too, to be able to say, Kat, turn your camera off. And <laughs> so I was busy my checking car. myself out. <laughs> <laughs> Making sure I had the right angle without my front light. Um, Ash, while we're there, let's mm. get into some of the technical side of it. Um, what a, how do you pick a plat platform for whether it's an online conference or an online panel that's going to best suit your requirements? Uh, it all depends on what your requirements are, really. Um, it's always best to engage someone that can use multiple different platforms, which is what we can do, obviously. Uh, that way we can just tailor whatever it is to a solution for whatever their needs be, whether it be a virtual conference, expo, or just a simple broadcast out or if they do need two-way video. The two-way video is the biggest determining factor actually as to what to use um, and your audience size. Because obviously you don't want 300 different people coming in and being able to see 300 different little thumbnails. Uh, that can get very, very difficult to manage. Oh, um, I like it. <laughs> so it's always, always best to work out that just as you would, like I said, a normal event. Yeah. Um, there's a question that popped up that is relevant very much to this. Um, Deb's asking if the bandwidth for a speaker is not good, what can you do at the last minute? And I've, I've, to be honest, I feel like we're tempting fate right this minute. I just realised that my kids are probably both using their consoles in the other room and I haven't switched um, <laughs> Wi-Fi channels. Um, but what, what are your backup options? What, particularly when at the moment when we are in isolation and you can't just necessarily you know, get all of your panellists into a studio. Uh, we can pre-record them. So what we can do is, for example, if you're doing a live conference uh, and the guests can't, or the presenters, sorry, not the guests, the presenters can't actually be live, um, we can link up with them at a time that they can, and then we can pre-record their um, presentation. And then nice. when, on their slot, in their wherever their slot happens to be in the conference program, we just hit play on a um, video record. Yeah, okay. Cool bananas. I like that. I like that. Um, Jody. I want to come back to that comment that you made before about protecting your panel conversations and your events. Um, obviously, there is a, a, we we need to dramatically shift um, to monetizing some of these kind of a, some of these kind of events. But if people are sending around a link and you're not actually checking them off at the registration desk, how do you protect? Um, yeah, how do, you, how do you protect your events? How do you make sure that the people who have paid get in and the people who haven't don't? Uh, to be perfectly honest, I, I don't have a good answer for that when you're using Zoom. Like there are other platforms uh, that um, track the IP address so that it's the right people coming in. I know that's a huge issue right now for associations that are tracking um, PD points and um, that kind of thing that need to know that the right person is watching it and that they are actually watching it and they're engaging with it so that they can get their points. Um, but I haven't, uh, to be honest, I haven't got a good answer for that yet. Sorry. That's okay. I'm so working on it. If anyone out there has a good answer for me, tell me. Uh, there are programs out there where you can integrate um, complete registrations into other programs that PCOs use. So that is possible now. And um, we can also, using Zoom as an example, there's actually a lot of the way you set up the webinar. We didn't do it today, but there's a lot of different registration options you can put in for your guests to come in to ensure that they come in and not somebody else. Can you do, can you do unique passwords for like that email address has this password? Uh, they set up, they can, you can do stuff like that in a separate program where they set up their own accounts and things like that. Um, that's actually real handy if you're doing like a virtual conference with expo presenters or sponsors where you want to give them a discounted rate on the uh, conference as opposed to a normal attendee. I'm loving all the questions that are coming in, everyone. Thank you. I will get to most of them. Um, uh, there was a, Amanda's just asking a clarification question, Ash. What's two-way video? So video from the risk for the participants as well. So what they did before they came into the webinar for networking. So that means that participants and attendees have a video as yeah. well. So not bad for small groups, but then once Correct. you've, and particularly when we're trying to do what we're doing now, which is four of us on screen at once, we want to protect the bandwidth. And so the webinar is better. 
Awesome. And the other question that I have before we move off this technical stuff, um, has anyone on the panel, this is from Claire, has anyone on the panel had experience with virtual conference platforms like VFairs, VFairs or Six Connects? If so, can you recommend some? No, but I will check them out tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you very much. Have you used them, Claire? I'll wait for Claire's answer and we'll move on to the next question. Um, Tanya, you're a people person like me. Um, what can get lost in an online panel and how are you kind of replacing what's lost in that face-to-face -face environment, both with your clients, but also how do you think we can do it in a conference environment? Yeah, I think, you know, often um, you get your energy from the audience. So it's really hard um, when you don't get that feedback and, you, you know, you, when, when you're on a panel, you can kind of read the audience and, and know if you're sort of hitting the mark. Whereas when you can't see the audience, that becomes really difficult. So I think that... Um, I think it's a really difficult one and, and some of the tools that are available on these platforms trying to get some engagement. I know we've been trying to do it with a number of the, the presentations and things that we're doing. It's like, you know, use the tool and raise your hand and, you know, participate in a poll and try and do all these things. But, um, you know, look, I think it, it's interesting. So some people, you know, do that. But, but I think we've also got to um, understand that, you um, it's us that kind of looks for that feedback so we can't just just because we're not getting it doesn't mean that what you know the participants are getting out of it is not equally as good so um, so it, I, I think it's probably more just a perspective thing that that potentially we just have to get used to um, and you know so you're feeding off the interaction or we're feeding off the interaction with the panel um, and we're hoping that the, the people that are listening to us are getting what they need out of it and I think that the chat's really good so the questions like when we're getting questions then you think okay well that's there's some engagement there and, and um, I think that really helps so we've just got to learn to use these tools and the great thing is that as we um, we're forced into this environment that people will get more and more used to using those tools. So I think it will become a lot more natural and intuitive. Um, so yeah, that's, that, that's probably my perspective. I think that, you know, we've, uh, we've, got, to, we've got to put some perspective around it um, and make sure we're delivering value, yeah. I think what, one of the saddest, to me, as a city CDO, one of the saddest memes that are doing the rounds at the moment is um, who's responsible for driving your organisation's digital transformation? A, the CEO, yeah. B, yeah. the CTO, or three, yeah. Corona. And I'm exactly. like, it's Corona. It's yeah, awful. It is. It is. It's awful. But, it, but it's great because <laughs> I just think it's so exciting. You know, I work in innovation and I, you know, I've said to a number of people, I don't think I could get this level of transformation through any other means you know in so two weeks in two yeah, weeks so it's it's fascinating it's two weeks it feels like six months but you know um it's it's really quite fascinating how quickly people are adapting so we're really we're going okay well we've got that through what else can we get through you know so yeah. um yeah. now's the time to kind of just try new things yeah because we don't have a choice no. we do not have a choice um i want to pick up too on that whole energy conversation uh one of the things that i've always done when i'm run, running webinars and when you don't have that um interaction when you don't have that faith that feedback is actually overdo it be be even bigger it be even bigger than i normally am which is kind of scary but recognize that you know you've got to actually use your voice more you need to use your hand just as more in your face and your eyes and really be far more engaging than you would be if you were in person um, because it's also awkward for the audience right when you're sitting and in fact I was I was in New Zealand the day well I was in New Zealand the day that Jacinda announced that all international travellers would have to self-quarantine. So I just missed out on that. So I reckon I participated in probably one of the last face-to-face -face conferences in New Zealand that we'll see for a while. And they had beamed in quite a few speakers and they just sat there and they talked and they delivered their presentation as if it was, and it was, it was tedious. Yeah. And at least if it was face-to-face, -face, you would have something else to, you know, operate with, but it was, tedious so yes that over the top expression i think is one of those important things and of course um if you can stand up now my room doesn't enable me and i can see that all of our panelists are sitting down this evening but i would always advise if you could for this kind of thing set your computer up so you can stand so you've still got that up energy 
Um, we've got so many questions coming in, so I'm going to try and do them in order. Um, what other platforms do you recommend? Maybe this is a question for Ash being our technical expert. Um, so Sally uses Crowdcast, but keen to see what else is out there for work, uh, platforms for virtual workshops. Virtual workshops. We do, um, virtual workshops is a bit harder, obviously, because you're smaller audience than more virtual conferencing and um, webinars like we're doing now. Uh, webinar is actually a pretty good platform for workshops because it allows, um, it does allow a lot of screen sharing and things like that for you. Think of universities doing um, lectures and things like that. It does allow you to do a lot of that as well and record functions as well. Um, there's just so many different platforms out there. I definitely don't know them all. <laughs> um, I don't, I haven't met. Me, sorry, my son keeps telling me to use some gaming platform. <laughs> yeah, Twitch is a very common Twitch. one. That came, I mean, yeah, that's... yeah, that came out of the gaming, um, the gaming side of things and all the esports that you see coming up now. Yeah. Um, they use Twitch to stream all of that live. Um, a lot of these other programs too, which we actually haven't touched on yet, um, can actually integrate into YouTube Facebook, all of those other ones as well. So if you've got a YouTube channel, then you can plug this straight into your YouTube channel or Facebook Live. Actually, I did a Facebook Live last week and I found that very, that was very good. Um, mm. And you could, yeah, a lot of live interaction. I guess, uh, Sally, it depends on what are the key functionalities that you're looking for. What do you, do you need to be able to exactly. send people into a breakout room? Do you need to just deliver information? I know my son participated in a program on Monday that was actually using multiple, um, multiple platforms all at once. So they were using Slack to chat. They had Zoom for video conferencing. They sent people into Zoom breakout rooms and it was actually highly effective. Like I was watching them participate in it. It was fantastic. So um, yeah, I think it comes down to what you actually need to deliver your outcomes. Um, with, a, with a key reminder though, that you, the outcomes are what you're looking for here, not necessarily the functions. So think outcomes first for your participants and then think through the functions of it. Uh, Lydia asks, uh, what advice do you have for running a virtual conference that would traditionally span multiple days with multiple concurrent sessions? Yeah, ain't that the question of the, of the industry, right? Uh, how do, yeah, how do we do that? Very easily. We can do the entire conference virtually, believe it or not. Really? Every, yes, everything. You can just you can run multiple breakout rooms. Literally the entire conference as it was, you can run it virtually if that's what you'd like to do. With yeah, everybody at home. Sorry, sorry yes. I need to Kate, but nobody wants to sit in front of their computer screen for four days straight. I'm sorry. I don't think that Yeah. Like, I, I don't yeah. think you can do it in the traditional let's go away for four Correct. days. Like that, um, that hashtag, there's that hashtag vid19. Can you throw that slide up, Ash? That's been going for 19 days now, I think, and it's still going. And they've got 360-something yep. speakers or something like that. And you register for each individual session that you want to go to. Correct. I think that's closer to what's going to happen. Because yeah. nobody's going to sit there and watch the whole thing for four that, days. That's exactly what I was about to say. So that's you can also do that as well. So here's the um, 19 days over 336 uh, contributors onto this uh, conference. It's not too dissimilar to having a uh, multi-day conference with a few thousand people. Um, across different rooms. So if you've got 10 rooms current running concurrently at the same time, you can still do that virtually as well. Um, the best bet would be, or the best idea to do that so you don't have people dropping off and you keep all your registrations in that up is to actually have the registrations per session, not per room. So normally you would have like a panel room and then you would have time for them, or sorry, a plenary room and then a breakout room and give them time to move in and out between them. Uh, if you make the registrations per session before in advance and all the attendees can go through the role, uh, go through the program, sorry, and have a look at what they want, register for the sessions they want to see. But, but yeah. in that case, would you do it live though? Like, Yeah, you can still run it live because people then want to see. So that way, yeah, people still want to see that live sometimes. So you can still do it live or otherwise then you're just, all you're doing is just recording content and just putting it out there. Yeah, and turning it into like a Netflix. Correct. Yeah, gallery. that's exactly right. 
That's exactly right. So yeah. the idea of having a live conference and having that is that then you still have all the networking. We can you can even do virtual exhibitions and things like that. Virtual exhibitions are a bit harder, obviously, because you want people there looking at the content and you know they want to speak to the um, sales rep. There are other virtual ways around that, um, but yeah. So that's the whole idea. So you can still run that conference um, and then have all those, just tweak them a little bit for virtually. There's not a lot of difference you have to do, just a little bit of tweaking, like in terms of the registration for um, for days and start moving that towards uh, speakers and presenters. What does Tanya think? Sorry, can I ask Tanya? Tanya yeah. Oi, who's the facilitator here? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just know that Taking Tanya over. has different opinions. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I do think, I, I think that, and, you know, I'm testing people's thoughts around this, um, you know, amongst, amongst different clients and businesses out there. And, and you know, the general, um, I guess, feedback that I'm getting is, is sort of when we come out of this the other side, potentially um, people will, so yes, I think people will want to interact and they'll want to go back to, you know, the conferences as they knew it. But I think that because they've now evolved and, and got so used to different technology that perhaps um, it'll be more of a blended approach. So where they, you know, they'll, they'll actually be able to attend more things, but they'll be able to use technology to get um, and interact with things that are going all over, you know, around the world. So they may pick and choose a little bit more, I think is, is the general sense of, you know, some of the feedback I get from people when I kind of pose this question. Um, so, you know, so that's quite interesting. It might be that they're more selective about the ones they want to attend in person, but maybe there's this hybrid approach where, you know, it allows a bit more flexibility because I think people will actually get used to this, um, you know, being in their home environment and using technology and, and see the benefits and the positives that that has um, and, and potentially want to have a little bit more of a hybrid approach. You know, that, that's, that's probably um, where I see it may go. Um, I think that, you know, I don't think we're going to come out of this and everyone's, I mean, different people react differently. So will people rush out and, and all want to start traveling? Will people rush out and all want to, you know, start gathering again? Uh, some people yes but some people no and you know so I think we've got to cater there's this great opportunity to cater for the trend that we've now created and the habits that we're now creating that people are going to get really comfortable with. I, th I couldn't agree more Tanya I think one of the things that this is going to demonstrate to us is that you don't have to jump on a plane and incur the accommodation costs and the flight costs and the logistical challenges to attend a conference when it can be delivered really well um, online. So I think that actually brings me then into Gil's question. He's asking what your thoughts are on pricing online conferences versus in person. Does a $2,000 physical conference become a $200 online event? Gosh, I hope not. Um, what do the panelists think about that? I think that um, we, that, I suppose the conferences, though it'll push the bar higher in terms of what, the expectation of people attending conferences, what they want out of it. I think that they will, you know, be looking, they'll be picking and choosing a whole lot more about what they want to consume. And, and so therefore, you know, it, it challenges, how do you deliver conferences? How do you create that experience? How do you do things differently um, to get people to re-engage and, and want to, you know, either travel? Because I think they'll, they'll be a lot more selective around it. So uh, to me, it is, um, it's very much a value conversation. I think you can charge, you know, a decent amount if the value is there and what people get out of it um, is, you know, is equal or more, I think the expectation is probably more than what they previously may have got out of a conference. So, you know, very much a value proposition. I look at it from my business perspective and would I pay to do that? I think I'm going to be really careful with where I spend the money um, in terms of, and, and the, the value expectation that I get out of it. So, um, you know, so that's, um, that, that's probably my perspective in, in, in terms of what you can charge. I was just thinking too, um, we're in a really interesting societal shift where the internet, when the internet first became mass accepted or when we all had access to it, we expected a lot of things to be free online. We expected our news to be free. We expected social media platforms to be free, all of those kind of things. And we've moved past that now. You know, we, we pay for our email unless you're still using Hotmail, but you, if you're using Hotmail and you're paying for it with it with ads, um, we pay for our software as a service. We pay for our news. 
so I think it's probably a really interesting opportunity for the conference um, organize, you know, for the PCO industry, for the event industry to not go down that spiral, to actually not accept the invitation that just because it's online, it should be free and instead go, no, here's, here's our event and this yeah. is how we're delivering it. Uh, I suspect yeah. as well that when, um, when we all do come out of our houses and we can go back to meeting face to face, that the value proposition for meeting face to face will be different. It won't be just about the content anymore. It'll be about the networking. It'll be about the meeting your colleagues and it'll be about the time you're spending together. And that like, I think in the past, everyone justified going to conferences by showing their boss the content and going, look what I'm going to learn. But in fact, that's only half of why they go. Yep. Absolutely. So many questions coming through. I'm going to sort through some of them while I put our panellists to another question. Um, since we're, we are talking about some fundamental shifts in the event industry, how do you continue to, live, to deliver values for sponsors in an online event scenario? I mean, I, we've done a shout out this morning to some of Network's partners. How do you continue to deliver value for sponsors when we're meeting online and there's not, say, an exhibition or a opportunity to showcase face-to-face. -face. Absolutely. Um, that's actually a point that I was going to make about the previous question about costing as well. I mean, obviously, when you're doing a, an event uh, in a hotel, for example, you'd have sponsors sponsoring lunches, rooms, different sessions, et cetera, et cetera. You can actually still do that live. So you can still have all that sponsorship money coming in for the live event. So you can still have them sponsoring that session, have their banners across the session. Uh, you can even go one step further by having an ad for them before and after the session as well. So you can pop in ads between sessions and breaks as well for them. Beautiful, thank you. Essentially that, um, that breakout room function as well, which mm. I um, didn't use to its full capacity at all, sorry everyone. But you can actually nominate who's in what room. So you could potentially put a sponsor in a room with mm -hmm. some buyers and um, you know, control who's in Strategically what allocate. Strategically, Strategically like allocate, that. yes. Absolutely. <laughs> you can do other things too with sponsorships as well, like when people register for a session or for a day, uh, that sponsor gives out a little gift for them with their registration pack, because normally you'd send out a registration pack. You can put that back onto the sponsors, put some more sponsorship into there as well. Yep, I love it. Um, um, kathy has got a really good question coming back to the whole charging for your online events. If you charge people to attend your virtual event, then it makes it difficult to post the content afterwards on your social media and web channels when people can download it for free. How do you get around this problem? Don't post it. <laughs> <laughs> or, maybe, or maybe just post, you know, the highlights. Yeah. With Think about um, people have been doing this for years. This is nothing new. Think about people that are selling their content now selling lectures, selling motivational speakers. They mm -hmm. sell all their different speeches live now through their platforms. That's not too dissimilar from what we're talking about right now. Yeah. So does it really open up a new revenue stream, you know, Absolutely. and a new opportunity? Because, you know, you can have entices um, to show sort of elements and highlights of what you've done, but then it, it can actually produce an ongoing revenue stream beyond exactly. the conference. Um, and I think that's the opportunity that, you know, I look at this whole industry of events and, and conferences and event management and, and planning, and I think it hasn't evolved a lot, you know, in the last 20 years. And so now there's all of this um, disruption. And, and I think this is great opportunity to really sit back and say, well, you know, how can we actually take this forward in a very different um, way and strategy and, and business model because I, I think that's the the great opportunity that um, you have at the moment in terms of events and event management. Absolutely and the other thing we haven't spoken about is all these streaming services at the moment they're a month per month pay per view or well, not pay per view but pay per month. Um, no one's done a conference pay per month yet. Imagine if you have your conference up there and you have a monthly subscription for that conference and you hold that virtual conference twice a year. Oh, oh, oh! Like that, Ash. Very good. Can't take <laughs> notes and juggle four screens at the same time. But oh, somebody <laughs> remind me of that one later. Um, Deb's asking a question about technique, um, headphone and mic combo, or use your computer's functionality. Now, this this was an interesting one, wasn't it, Ash? From the techie perspective, what's your thoughts? Uh, definitely don't go with computer audio. Um, unfortunately, Jody is at the moment. <laughs> for various different reasons. Um, 
it's always better if you keep your microphones and your headphones separate. So a headset like what Tanya has there. Um, I actually, at the moment, I have a broadcast mic and in-ears on at the moment. So that's obviously the best case, oh. scenario, just like a news presenter would. Um, it's always best to work with that. As soon as you start bringing a speaker into it in terms of microphone, you start creating a whole heap of different issues. Yeah, and Just, and also on the um, on the headset one, it may not look the most attractive, but um, it's bulletproof. So I use one with a, a USB plug-in. I do a lot of um, calls and and um, meetings globally, and without fail, whenever I go for the um, the cordless one, it will die partway through the the um, call, or it will, you know, the Bluetooth drops out. It's, it's got so many points of failure. So um, I've just, I've given up on, on anything that kind of might look a little bit more discreet and I've just gone, no, it's important that I can actually hear and speak. And um, so I, I just go with one that plugs in with a USB and, you know, is, is pretty much, um, it doesn't have points of failure like some of the other solutions. And remembering too, this is where we're talking about running an online event. Um, you know, plenty of team meetings, of course, have been conducted with whatever whatever you've got available and whatever anybody can, what people can afford. Just switching my screen around, I'm using a podcasting mic that I've had for a while um, from all of my podcasting days. Um, so that just generates a much better sound um, and I feel I feel that the sound is more solid than if I was just using the headset which I'm purely just using for, for ears basically I'm actually not using the mic so Deb I hope that gives you some ideas um, again it depends how many how often you're going to use it you know um, I'd certainly be talking to the guys at select to uh, talk about the best equipment for what you need um, there was a I had a question that I've lost but I will um Jody's already talked about um, vid19. Have the panels seen any other good examples of online conferences or online panel discussions yet that they're kind of like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some of that. We had the code event that um, they very quickly had to switch from a physical event, you know, to um, to a virtual event, which I think they they pulled it, you know, that off in, in a massively short period of time. Um, it was interesting, and because it because it became um, a, a virtual event and kind of opened up um, to everyone, it got sent around all of our teams. It's like you know, jump in, and and so they had the ability to bring more people in. And I would have loved to have got to some of those events, but then you know, it's kind of I think when um, and this is the thing on pricing when it's free you just you know you don't you think oh it's free so you don't tend to make the effort to be there and be online so i think the pricing point is really important if you're going to take these events into the virtual world value the content and value what you're delivering and and put it at a price point that makes people show up because um free just kind of you know, um, it, it's kind of, that's a nice to have. And if I can get time, I'll jump in, but it doesn't create that um, sense of value and, and people actually um, jumping on it and committing to it. You know, I, it was an interesting one for me because I would have loved to have gone to some of that content. It's kind of in my space, but um, you know, I, I didn't, uh, there's a lot going on. So, you know, I didn't get there, but, um, and then I, I got the, uh, the, the response sort of saying, well, that's, um, you've got so many days to log on and, and see the, you know, um, download. And I didn't even get to do that. So, you know, I think it, it's really, um, it's important that you get a commitment in terms of, of someone paying and, and valuing what you're delivering. I think that's really interesting, Tanya, because we were speaking before about uh, that question of, well, if you do an online event and you charge less for it and then, you know, what stops people from just downloading for free? If the value wasn't there to start with, people won't. It's just like, oh, yeah. It's just more content. It's just more content. And, you know, there's so much content at the moment. We're just being overloaded by it. So you're getting very selective about what you want to consume. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Um, I'm also being given a hot tip that people might want to have a look at CiscoLive.com. Mm. I will let people do that in their own time. Um, other, I don't think I've got any other questions um, coming through. I've got a couple of comments. Um, I do actually want to talk about this because this was my has been my experience too. Ingrid has mentioned that it's been really awesome how QUT 
um, business schools as well as other parts have moved all of their teaching online. Um, and she thinks it'd be great for conference organizers, corporates and, ed and educators to get together to learn more from each other. So perhaps Jody, we can um, facilitate a special networks isolation edition, bringing everyone together and That's actually learn from each other. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. Good charge for that one though, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, just while one more question on the um, pricing. Um, it is interesting. If you're going to take your conference online, you, of course, remove some of the hard costs like hot meal, beverages, um, AV, though you probably wouldn't remove the AV. You would still keep your professional AV. Um, do you think that makes a difference in your pricing decisions, Jody. Or do you, is the, is, is, and when you're pricing a conference, is the meal almost uh, an added bonus? Um, no, well, the, the, the venue kind of costs make up a, a big proportion of conference costs. Um, I think that what is potentially forgotten though, is there's like even, there's, there's still the organisation of it to be done. You've, someone's still got to find the speakers and someone's still got to work out what you're talking about and there still needs to be test runs and there still needs to be AV. And so it, I think it kind of, right now, it feels like it doesn't take much to just get everyone on their webcam and talk. And that's not actually, like I think you, we, we should be treating these like it's a normal event, there's just no venue. Yeah. And there should be costs involved. In that I, as well. Yeah, I agree. And I, I actually think that we're going to hit um, online event fatigue pretty quickly. Yep. Um, there's in the in the early in this early stage of everyone going, oh, my God, we're in lockdown. There's a lot of stuff going. In fact, I've got something on every night next week, yep. all from the comfort of my own pajamas. <laughs> um, I won't do that. Um, but yeah, I think we're, I think we will have to start. Um, rethinking our scheduling of that and re and if all reports are correct we're actually in this for quite a while so actually you know treat it like a marathon instead of a sprint mm. um i'm going to go to our panelists to ask for some of their top tips um alexi that question's been answered the question about the brand and model is your headset has been answered it is a jabra um, I'm just checking other questions to make sure that we haven't missed too many. I will acknowledge uh, audience that I'm not asking all questions because there are some that are um, a little bit too niche, um, but I'm sure our panelists will answer them if you tweet them a little bit later or if you email. Speaking of which, if you're not already tweeting, Instagramming, remember that we do want to see all of your social photos later. So take a selfie with this screen in the background on your particular setup, podcasting mic, headphones or nothing, whatever the case may be and post it to your favorite social media platform with the hashtag nxbriz and the hashtag isolation edition is that right jody say so, yes beautiful um another question just came in there's so many i'm not sure actually what i prefer a hand up in the room or multiple platforms to receive questions on uh, you're welcome, Alexi. Uh, Stuart says, what are your tips for helping <laughs> unsavvy tech people quickly learn what to do to access? Um, is it still a barrier? Um, and it is interesting, actually. Uh, I was actually reflecting that my son's school in years seven to eight, they actually don't have laptops and they're about to go to an online platform. So that's going to be really interesting for a lot of people. Ash, what are your tips for quickly moving people into online environments without, I guess, without overwhelming them with all the bells and whistles that we know that the platforms can do? Uh, just pick a simple platform, really, is, is the easiest way. The simpler you keep it, um, the easier it will be for the participants. That's why I was talking about the two-way video before. Uh, you get rid of that, you get rid of a lot of issues, a lot mm. of issues. That way they don't speak and they don't um, there's no video from the participants, but they can chat as they would normally. It's a lot easier for anybody and everybody to use. And so just keep it simple for the attendees. Keep it as simple as possible. That way that you'll get the most people attending or you'll get the broadest people coming in. And what are your thoughts? Sorry, I suggest a rehearsal for your panellists yeah. on the actual machine that they're going to be using. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a learning from tonight, Jody? Perhaps, yeah, perhaps. Perhaps, uh, yeah, it's funny. Actually, in that, I mean, as simple as that sounds, right? The machine that you're using is often quite 
different to other machines, whether it's a MacBook, whether it's Internet Explorer, whether it's Firefox, you know, like all yeah. of the different browsers, let alone the operating systems, work yeah. differently. That's a bit um, different for attendees as opposed to presenters or panellists. I mean, presenters, panellists, we always catch up with prior to an event anyway. Um, so that way we can make sure that all their stuff is set up, ready to go for them. Yeah, yeah but we, we tested that with me in my office yesterday, Ash. Yeah, it was a, it was a <laughs> quick change, here. last minute And change. now I'm on a Mac and I'm yeah. on a Mac. Refresher <laughs> <laughs> though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if it's any, if, if it's any consolation, Jody, um, my son's iPad stopped working, so I couldn't have my second screen for running the questions. So I've yeah. had to be running them off my phone in little tiny view uh, like this and kind of, yeah, which is not my ideal, but we just keep rocking and rolling it, don't we? Um, do, 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 do. There was, I had another question there and I've lost it. Oh, yeah, Ash, can, um, I've been asked a lot lately why you Zoom over Skype for business or over Google Hangouts or anything like that. I don't necessarily want you to go into all of the advantages and disadvantages, but are you seeing that there's a couple of platforms that are kind of emerging as the most user friendly or the ones that um, require the least tech savviness to use? Uh, not necessarily tech savviness. It depends solely on what you're using it for, to be honest. Uh, the biggest one I've seen increase in the last two weeks is actually Teams, Microsoft Teams. Yeah. Um, just speaking to my wife, actually, because she's just started using it for work because everyone's working remotely now. So they're using that um, to engage like we are and we did before with the Zoom meetings. Um, it depends solely on that. Uh, Zoom is good for outside of organisations. Things like Teams uh, particularly is really good for inter-organisations. So if you've got a big organisation, Teams is really good for just communicating with them. The problem with these platforms like this and these meetings is they're not designed to do virtual conferencing. It's as simple as that. They're designed to meet with people, not conference and not webcast out to a lot of people. Yeah. So for something like that, um, it's not necessarily a program, but a company that you go to that will manage that for you, like us, for yeah. example. Gotcha. A question for Tanya, actually for all of the panellists from David, he's asking what are your client and sponsors' feedback so far? recognising that we're probably only two weeks into the real onslaught of this new world order that we live in. What's their feedback about um, conferences, events, panels moving online? Do you think they, do they think it's going to move solidly well past the, this isolation phase? Are, are other event organisers moving forward with their planned events and taking them online? Like what's their, what are their thoughts? Um, look, we had um, we had a number of conferences um, across our organisation that were planned for this year and globally actually that um, that got cancelled. And you know, I, I've been challenging people's thinking because I, I think that, um, and Jody and I talk about this a little bit as well. That you know, um, there's still there was a lot of planning that went into it, and you know, they were pretty much ready to roll. And there was some great content and great messages and, and kind of aligning and bringing together people with strategy. So um, I, I'm kind of challenging, well, well, why can't we go ahead and still do it? It might look different. It might be shorter. Yes, we're not traveling, but um, there were some really valuable pieces of information that I, I fear that if we don't go ahead and deliver these conferences during this period of, of sort of lockdown, that, um, you know, we're going to miss some opportunities. We're going to put ourselves back in terms of potentially getting some alignment or some strategies or some thinking um, out there. So, you know, so I mean, I, my personal perspective and certainly um, the way in which I've been approaching it is really trying to challenge how do we do this? So it's really great to hear some of um, Ash's perspectives on, you know, how, how this could happen because I think that's the biggest problem that people are needing to solve at the moment. So we've got the content there's sort of the desire there once everything settles down a little bit um, to to potentially still move forward with conferences but how do we do it and how do we facilitate it and you know that's where um, understanding what solutions are available is really important so you know I, I, I take the view that um, I don't think conferences should stop and I don't think that people out there are suggesting that um, we stop and everything has to pause it's just the travel stopped so you know, the content's still there, the people are still there. Um, you know, I, I would really like to see events, um, and I think we need to see events still happening through this period. 
Um, it's going to be different, you know, and they'll be delivered in a different way. But let's let's run with it while we're disrupting, <laughs> you know, we're, <laughs> while everyone's changing and while there's this whole, you know, mood of, of um, I don't know, people are just so willing to, to do things differently. Um, great opportunity to just go, well, you know, let's just see. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah let's create it. Jodie, well, what are your I, thoughts? I think we need to find the way to um, still make people want to attend all at the same time to maintain the networking and the meeting and stuff without them going, oh, that's just me talking to my screen, so I've got better things to do. Uh, like, and, and that- I, I think that's the breakout rooms, you know, Jody. like that, yeah. you know, the experience, I mean, that to me solves so much and, you know, that everyone's talking about breakout rooms now because it's become such a hot thing to do. So um, <laughs> I think it's, um, you know, it, it's, that's, cha- that's a game changer. You know, that was something that probably a month ago, very few people even knew, even though that functionality was in the platform, very few people even knew about it because we yeah. didn't have a need for it. Yeah. Um, now it, we'd have a need, it's there, we yeah. could easily do it. Uh, you know, I, I'm really sort of challenging people on, on this and saying we, we need to go forward and still have conferences. Yeah. I also well, think, um, sorry, Jodie, I, I also think that um, it comes back to that value proposition. If you've mm-hmm. invested and if you've paid um, and then if the content is dynamic enough, if your facilitators, your MC, your moderators, like if that's all maintained, recognising that you're in a different environment, um, you know, if a boring conference, if you're sitting in a boring conference room, you're still checking your emails and doing whatever. Um, it's just that you get to go out for the break together. So I think it, yeah. And, and there's fun things like, you know, I'm seeing it with my kids. So I've got four children all at home. Oh my God. Um, and it's crazy having them at home. But but it's interesting seeing how the teachers are interacting. And, and like I was trying to do a, a workshop the other day and, and I presented my daughter's running around the house. I go, what are you doing? I'm doing a scavenger hunt. So they did an online scavenger hunt with oh. the kids finding stuff within their house. Um, and I go, what a great idea because it got them moving. And, it, you know, it created this fun and this energy um, and, and I go, wow, that's, now that's a great idea. That's it. Yeah. Next time we're doing a scavenger hunt. Yeah. People have to come back and show them. <laughs> but it, you know, isn't that, isn't that just, I just think, wow, you know, I love, I love the ideas that are coming out because you just think that we would never have had these other, these ideas. Um, we would never have had a reason to think differently. Um, so there's a lot of positives, I think at the moment as well. Yeah. I like that. Um, Jody, did you want to add something more? Because I interrupted you. I can't remember now. Sorry. The truth. I had it. You had something very profound to say, but I've lost it now. So. Oh, uh, it was the coming together, Jody. You were. Oh, you know, we we got onto the breakout oh. rooms, but you were talking about the coming together of people. Well, yeah, I think there, and I think we need to get away. From, well, people have that on-demand kind of Netflix thing where I want to watch it when I want to watch it so the, the content part I think people want to see when they want to see it but we need to be able to facilitate them coming together and talking to each other like they would in a conference and I haven't worked out in my head what that model is like I don't I don't know how to do that yet so anyone with ideas please tell me um, a quick technical question just on the breakout rooms has just popped through do you allocate people to the breakout rooms or is it random uh, uh, you both. can allocate you can do it either way yeah awesome so That's just in Zoom. There's lots of other programs you can use that do the same sort of thing. So there's other programs out there as well uh, where you can, instead of um, instead of like the rooms, you can the attendees can go in and out of those rooms as they please. So if there's four people in this room, another attendee can come in, say good day, or and then leave and go to another one as well. Yeah. So we did it randomly. I just it, it was based on the number of people that were in the room, and it said make it so that around five people are in each room and it just randomly went just like that. It made that noise too. And we do, we use um, the breakout rooms when we're running um, facilitated events and, and workshops. And um, it, as a, as a facilitator, you can, you can bounce from room to room. So you, you teleport from one room to the next room and, um, and you can check in. And then, you know, we've had um, someone comes into this room and says, look, this room needs a bit of help over there. So then, then they stay in this room and they send me over to another room. And so, you know, it's, it's quite interactive. And even though you're kind of just sitting here, you're not physically walking around it, you know, you're bouncing and working with different dynamics of people. So, 
you know, I, lo I mean, I love technology. So I just, I'm so excited by, you know, what's happening and, and the change that we're seeing. Um, I think oh. it's, it's a really great opportunity. You've got me so excited, Tanya, I must admit. Like, it, yeah, that's, I'm just like, oh, yeah. Um, now, we are, we, we're rapidly hitting towards the end of time and if we were in a real life, um, in, a, in a real room, somebody would start making this signal at me to wind me up. Yeah, so I best uh, start winding this up. Um, panel, um, we might kick off with you, Ash, because I'm very aware that the uh, women on this panel have had, we've, we obviously haven't used up our word count today. <laughs> We've saved it all up for tonight. So, Ash, can you kick us off? What, are your, what would your top tip be for anyone looking to run an online conference? Uh, same as you would. Don't think of it as an online conference. Just think of it as a conference, as you normally would. You plan it as you normally would. Uh, the only diff real difference in terms of live versus virtual that you should really be aware of is timings. But everything else that you do in a live conference, you need to do in the virtual conference as well. Like we touched on about background music, question and answers, uh, recording and making them available. Um, obviously, there's a lot more chance to make that as paid per view now uh, or a subscription or something like that. Uh, and then still thinking about your sponsors. Where are you going to get your sponsorship dollars from? Uh, what sessions are you going to brand? How are you going to brand them? Uh, landing pages, you can brand landing pages or the actual videos themselves. And then obviously adverts running through them as well. Uh, a lot of places used to have like uh, sponsors come up uh, and do a little spiel beforehand. That could be replaced with the TVC now. Beautiful. The TVC is a TV commercial? Yes. <laughs> uh, Tanya, what are your top tips for running online events? Look, I think that um, we have a very forgiving environment at the moment. Um, so, Sorry. you know, my... <laughs> Um, which is great because you can jump in like now is like there's no better time to jump in and try something different um, just as you have with this Jody I think you know jump in give it a go and and people are really forgiving I did a workshop today oh my gosh and I had um, I my internet dropped out probably about 10 times um, I had a tradesman here that cut off the power. I had to move to a different room and I managed to, you know, keep everyone in the workshop and still deliver it, you know, and, and no one, no one was upset. Like in, in a real world, if that had happened in a conference and the facilitator had have been taken out, I mean, oh my gosh, the complaints you would get. So, so I guess my top tip is just, you know, jump in, give it a go, um, you know, challenge the thinking in terms of what you're doing and, and potentially the way in which you might um, run events and try some of these online, um, you know, opportunities and, and, the, and the models too. Don't um, make sure you extract value and, and you charge for, for the value that you're delivering. Big, big tip. Um, you know, we do a lot, of, a lot of work in pricing strategy and that's one thing that I think you have to you have to make sure you're, you're charging for the value. And, you know, also just, you know, give it a go. Um, challenge, challenge the business model is, is kind of my big tip because I, I think the opportunities are huge. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Ash, before I ask Jody for her final tip, there is a really, really good question that I do want to come back to because I actually think, um, I th I think there will be quite a few people wondering who is running the tech behind the scenes for us I tonight? Ju I just answered that. Oh, uh, did you? I no, did, yes. answer it for all of us. Yes, uh, it's just me. That's it, no one else. <laughs> if I could get the camera around, I would, but um, <laughs> that's it. It's I literally think, I just me. I'll see, I, actually, I'll see if I can take a photo. Hang on. While, um, while Ash is taking that photo, I would say, having done many webinars myself, <laughs> um, the, you, you want to be very... Um, comfortable with the tech if you're going to speak and run the tech at the same time um, I've been yeah I've been running all of the Q&A most of it tonight which requires um, some some effort um, in other webinars I've done there's always been other people running the Q&A flagging the questions doing all of that kind of jazz so I guess it depends on um, who you've got and when you've got a tech guru like Ash he can multitask <laughs> There is a couple of other people here in the office but it is literally just me here doing this <laughs> let's see if I can take a photo <laughs> Yeah, the rest of the select team are going, what are we? Stuff, just chop liver? <laughs> we'll, we'll put it up on Twitter. We'll get you to put it up on Instagram and on Twitter with the hashtags. <laughs> there you go. There's quite a, there. So there's a cameraman. Yeah, he only just come in because he was watching and then he heard. So he was going to bring the camera around. 
<laughs> All right. Well, since we've, uh, or we're wrapping up with a bit of levity, Jody, what are your top tips for uh-huh. people who want to run an online event? I'm more from a logistics and organizing background. I would say do a rehearsal <laughs> and um, have a, have a back channel to talk to everybody. So you're like calling the show in the background that other people can't see. Yeah. Yeah. We're certainly doing a lot of that. A lot Very of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, all righty. I, um, I think that there are still unanswered questions and I'm sorry, there are always going to be unanswered questions in any event like this. And, um, I'm going to keep to our very strict time rules because that's what a good event looks like. So would you please thank our panelists by maybe just, I don't know, sending a kiss or putting an X or putting a smiley face or something in the message box. Um, since we can't do a round of applause, just please put a message in there. I can see them all coming through. That's oh, that's awesome. So cute. That's lovely. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining um, the second uh, Network's Social Isolation Edition. And thank you for bearing with us in what is um, an experiment just as much for us as it was for you. Um, wishing you a fabulous night and um, look forward to seeing you again soon um panelists don't let's lock down this um this platform just yet because there are questions that we need to um archive and i don't know what happens when we close this down but audience thank you so much for joining us tonight and uh, i'm sure we'll see you again soon thank you